Um, hi everyone, my name is Amy Hohers, and I am a math professor at um, Kingwood. And um, tonight I have the pleasure of introducing you to an amazing woman, Miss Laura Wilkinson. Um, Laura is a three-time Olympian, and she is a gold medalist in three world events um, on 10-meter platform diving. Um, just for reference, 10 meters is about three stories high. Um, a lot of people don't realize how high that how how high that is up there. Um, Laura is also very active in the community. She grew up in the Klein area, has been on the Woodlands um, Diving Club for her almost your whole career, right, Laura? I think so. And um, she's also a mother, um, an inspirational speaker. And my son was actually lucky enough to um, have called Laura a teammate and a friend. And um, that's how we're lucky enough to have her here this evening. So with no further ado, Laura, I'm going to let you go ahead and take over. Um, thanks, Amy and Kristen, for having me on. Um, and I have to I have to say it was real fun um, diving with Anton. And he used to drive with me sometimes up to platform practices at AM and fall asleep in the back of my car. <laughs> so he's a, he's a lot of fun. It's been fun watching and cheering him on at Iowa. Um, well, thank you for having me. I know something that uh, Amy had requested we talk about was pursuing excellence and overcoming odds. And I kind of feel like overcoming odds is a big part of my story and my whole life. So I'll just kind of do that. I'll kind of tell you that. And I, I love that sports is just like the perfect analogy for life, right? We can really understand sports because it's very black and white. You know, there are rules, there's winners, there's um, losers. Like we just understand how the whole process works. And it's very clean and cut and there's no, you know, kind of misunderstanding. It's, it's usually really easy to understand whereas life can be full of gray and misinterpreted and, and hard to do it. So I love sports analogies um, and, and using my sports story to, I mean, not just show other people, but I, I learned myself from my stories in the pool on how to live my life um, a little bit better. So overcoming odds has actually been incredibly beneficial to my life outside of the pool. But um, so anyways, in sports and in life, there are these moments, these kind of defining moments that we have in our lives where you kind of have to decide, you, you come to this big crossroads or this big decision, this big moment, and you have to decide, am I gonna take that leap of faith? Am I gonna go after this? Am I gonna do this big, hard or scary thing? And you know that can be really scary because we don't know how that's gonna turn out. And a lot of times fear or doubt, or there's all these things that can hold us back from taking that leap of faith. But unless we take that leap, we'll never know. And that very first moment of truth for me, that first leap of faith literally happened on a diving platform. So as Amy said, if you've never seen a diving platform, it's uh, 10 meters, which is equivalent to about the roof of a three-story building. So the top of a three-story building. So, and you know, if that doesn't sound too bad, the next time you're in a big building, go up to the fourth floor and take a little peek out the window and imagine flipping around a few times, maybe adding a couple of twists, going with no splash. <laughs> you might be starting to get the idea now. Well, the first time I looked up at the diving platform, I didn't think it looked too bad. So I ran right up there for my first jump. And the minute I stepped from the ladder onto the platform, my heart just jumped right up into my throat. It was so much higher looking down from the top than it had been looking up from the ground. So I took a few minutes to kind of steady myself and get used to the view. And, um, you know, it was quite nice up there, but then I kind of panicked because I didn't come up here for the view. I, I came up the ladder because I was going to jump off of this thing and one look over the railing and down the side, all I could think about was how badly I was gonna hurt myself. I was just terrified and, you know, but all my teammates are down there looking at me and there's no way I can chicken out in front of them, right? But one look over the edge to that water, far, far below, all I could think was how badly I was gonna hurt myself. But the truth was before I ever stepped foot on that ladder, I was going to jump off, that was my plan. And I feel like that's kind of how life is. We have these moments where sometimes we say, I want to try and do my best. I want to try and do this thing. But really, I feel like when we say I want to try something, it's kind of a cop out. It's not allowing yourself to fully commit and do your best. Like my coach says, you can't dip your toe in from the 10 meter to see if the water feels nice. You have to jump off with both feet. You have to jump in with both feet. That's commitment. You have to commit to jumping off a platform. And I feel like in life, we often have these cop-outs, we're like, well, I'll just try it. But we're not fully committing, we're not fully jumping in with both feet. And that day on that 10 meter, I tell you what, 
I was bound and determined to jump off that thing because I was not going to be made fun of by all my teammates who had done this before. And I was already up there, so I may as well do it. But y'all, I was terrified. So I took every little remaining ounce of courage that I had left and I kind of inched my way until I could feel my toes curl over the edge. I looked at that water far, far below. And I took a deep breath and I let it out. I extended my right foot and I jumped. And y'all, I mean, my stomach just dropped. I felt like I was falling for 10 minutes. I, I wanted to scream, but it's like I couldn't even get it out. And then finally I hit the water and underneath the water, all I could think was, that is the single coolest thing I've ever done in my whole life. And I wanted to run right back up there and do it again. It was like the minute I hit the water, I forgot about all the doubts and fears and scary things that I was thinking up on the top. I just, all I could think about was how fun it was. So I did, I ran right back up there for another jump. And the minute I stepped from that ladder onto that platform, some of those doubts and fears started to creep back in my mind. But the difference was this time, I knew that even though it was scary, I knew I was gonna enjoy that free fall. And y'all, that is so much what taking that leap in our life is. When we come to these crossroads or these big decisions we have to make, it is terrifying sometimes. You don't know how you're gonna land. You don't know if you're gonna get hurt in the process. You don't know if you're gonna end up where you wanna be or somewhere completely different. You don't know how it's gonna go. And that is so scary. But unless you take that leap, you will never find out. And y'all, every time I've taken that leap, it has not always gone well, but I've always grown and I've always moved forward. And every time I took that leap, it was less scary and it was more exciting. And I got better and better and better at it. So my first real shot at the Olympic games, it was in 2000. And, you know, I could see it laid out in my head, like some inspirational sports movie complete with soundtrack, you know, girl leaves college to pursue big dreams. She works insanely hard doing things men can't even do. She has a lesson learning setback, makes a big comeback, wins Olympic gold, the crowd goes wild, roll credits. I mean, that's kind of what we see in the movies, right? It's just like this sweet, beautiful dream and everything works out perfect. Well, that's not life, is it? <laughs> life is usually full of these different twists and turns and road bumps and well, I was in college at the time. I was at the University of Texas and um, I was on a full diving scholarship. I loved it. I'd went in CAAs a couple of times. All my friends were there. Like things were going great. Like my life had found a sweet spot and it was awesome. But the Olympics were coming. They were a year away. And that had been my dream since I was a little eight year old girl. And I saw Mary Lou Retton do this perfect 10 vault and won the hearts of the world, basically, you know, it's, it was everybody's dream after that point. And I knew it didn't, wasn't going to work out in gymnastics for me, but the dream of being an Olympian and going to the Olympics and standing on top of the podium had never left me. And so I had pursued other sports until I found diving. And here I was doing great in college, but the Olympics were coming. And I knew in order to train for that, the way I wanted to train, I felt like I needed to just be full-time training. Like I didn't want the distractions of school and of competing for college because while that's a great experience, it is exhausting. And after a full season, a full collegiate season, I mean, you're just wiped out. So to try to pick yourself up and, and go through and do Olympic trials and Olympic games, it's a lot. And so I wasn't sure that I could handle both. And I figured if this was my only shot at it, I really wanted to give everything I had, but I was scared to leave my scholarship to leave my parents, to, to like leave this unknown, you know, like everything's going good and right here and I, I can leave all this and go home and train, but what if I don't make the team? Like I still have to go qualify and make the team. And that was kind of a scary decision. And I, I talked to my parents and my mom was real concerned because she never finished college. And that was one of her biggest regrets. So she made me promise 8 million times that I would go back and finish my degree afterward, which I promised her I would. And uh, they were in full support. They said, this is a, a unique opportunity. I think you should, I think you should take it. So I felt like that was kind of my, my second really leap of faith is, is I left my scholarship behind and I went home with about two months rent saved up to try to get an apartment close enough to the pool so I could train full time. But, you know, I had to figure out how to get, I couldn't work a job at the same time. That was the reason I left school was I wanted to be able to focus on training the whole time. So how was I going to afford this apartment and train full time? So my dad actually helped me find an agent who helped me get my first sponsor, which covered just enough for rent and food. And I was like, I'm living the dream. Here I am. I take a leap of faith. Everything's working out, it's awesome. And then about three months before the Olympic trials, I ended up with a shattered right foot, three broken bones, a big purple cast. That was just three months before the Olympic trials. That was not part of my grand plan. 
so we were at this meet in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and we were doing kind of a typical meet warm up, uh, a warm up before we would get into train two, where you do somersaults or flips uh, onto like crash pads. But we were taking off of this block of wood, and I came out of one flip a little bit early, and I hit both of the balls of my feet on this block of wood. And, you know, there was immediate pain, swelling. We tried to ice it. We were hoping it wasn't a big deal. And my coach basically carried me to the emergency room where the doctor proceeded not to x-ray it and just to give me a pair of crutches and told me it would hurt more and it would be more swollen if it was broken. So you'll be fine. So I was stuck in Fort Lauderdale, Florida for a week in excruciating pain at this meet on crutches, not able to sleep, um, couldn't put any weight on it. I felt like there was a rock underneath it. It was horrible. Finally got home and you know the whole time I'm wishing it's nothing, but it felt like something I'd never felt before. And when I got home and my doctor at home x-rayed it, she said, if I had seen it when it happened, I may have been able to reset it but now it's kind of so far gone, we really have to do surgery or something, but that's gonna take you out of Olympic trials. So I had basically, you have in your feet, you know, metatarsals, just much like you have fingers here. Um, I basically broke all the knuckles off of my middle three bones. And one of them slid in between and lodged itself underneath. That's what the rock was that I felt like I was standing on. And within just like six or seven days from when it happened to when she x-rayed it, that bone that was lodged underneath, had, had actually calcified to the two bones next to it. So it was stuck there. That's why it was gonna require re-breaking, pinning back together, all this stuff to fix it. Um, so there's no way I could have done Olympic trials. But I had one other option. We could cast it the way it was and hope that it heals well enough to walk on, maybe jump off of. Yeah, that's not really what you wanna hear. You know, I, and that's what we decided to do. I felt like it was our only option, but that, that first week, um, just dealing with all the emotions of what was happening. Have you ever been like some in a moment like that where you just feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders? You know, I had I had left my college scholarship. I had left everything good and right in my world to come home, and this is my reward. And it felt like my whole world was just collapsing. Like like I was watching my dreams. They were like sand just slipping through my fingers. And you know, I was angry. I was sad. I was upset. There was almost weird relief in some way. Like, well, if I don't make it, nobody's going to blame me or nobody's going to, you know, I, I just felt like I had an excuse. Now it was all these weird, you know, weird emotions come about when you feel that way and you feel them all at once. And I, I remember the gravity of that kind of hitting me in my living room and I dropped my crutches and just fell to my knees and just, just bawling. And I started screaming at God, like, how can this be part of the plan? How can this be good for me? And it was in those moments on my living room floor that I really realized that this had been my dream since I was a little girl. And this might be my only shot at it. I had to try. I didn't want to look back in five years and say, what if? I wonder if I could have. I couldn't live with that. I'd rather try and just absolutely fail and at least know than to not try at all and always wonder. I couldn't live with that. I could live with failure. I couldn't live with the regret of not trying. And so I remember my coach came banging on my door early one morning and he kind of came in wagging his finger in my face like if we're gonna do this if you're you got to commit to do it and I was like I'm in I had already made my peace I said I'm in and he's like all right I have one rule we can't look back and say what if what if this hadn't happened we can only look forward make a new plan and we can only go forward looking forward we can't look back and so we proceeded to try to do things quite differently because I was in this big purple cast. I obviously couldn't be in the pool diving. So I would hop on my crutches. I happened to be in the apartment across the street from the pool because I couldn't drive at the time. So I was taking my crutches, hopping across the street to the grocery store, loading up my backpack with my groceries, coming back, hopping across the street, my crutches to the pool to train and then hopping back home. Like I got a lot of armpit work on those crutches. My forearms were like solid, a little Popeye action there. But um, when I was supposed to be at the pool training, um, we, we were getting creative. And what my coach had me do was he would hold my crutches and I would hop up the ladder on my one good foot all the way to the top. And I kind of shimmy my way out to the end and I would stand there and I would go through all the motions of my dives. And he would actually coach me from the pool deck, looking up and saying, oh, no, nope, your line's a little off. Correct this here, correct this there. And you know, got to the point where I could really feel my actions. I was trying to get as into it as I could, really visualizing everything I would see, everything I would hear, everything I would smell. I would try to put myself into like competitions, imagining who I'm competing against, what just happened. I'd make all these scenarios. And, you know, I would go through all of these every single day, every direction, all of my dives. 
and we were doing video study on the side. Um, we were doing, I was doing any kind of dry land I could, lots of, you know, core work and things like that, that I could do on one leg. Um, but as you can imagine, after weeks and weeks and weeks of pretending to dive up on the 10 meter in a giant purple cast, you start to feel a little silly. <laughs> I started to wonder like, how on earth is pretending to dive gonna get me to the Olympics? The kids and the, the swimmers and the pool across from us started to make fun of me. And I just, I kind of hit a point where I really felt hopeless. Like, this is a joke. Like, what am I doing here? This is so ridiculous. But it was really cool because in those moments, my teammates really came through for me. And I, you know, I was 22, I was coming out of college and all my teammates, they were probably like between eight and 18, you know, big range there. And they would say things like, hey, you got this, don't give up, you can do it. And it got to a point where I would do like a pretend entry on the 10 meter and they'd be on the other side of the pool and they go, I didn't see a drop of water, I'd give it a 10, you know, and they'd start cheering for me. It's like they saw what I was going through, but they were so invested now in what I was doing that they were believing in me. And so when I got to a point where I felt like giving up, those kids made all the difference in the world for me. I mean, so much difference that after 10 weeks and three different casts, I got my chance to go to the Olympic trials. And the, the reminder for me there is, is a couple of things. We need to surround ourselves with people who believe in what we're doing. Even if they think we're crazy for what we're doing, that they support us in what we're doing. You have to have people around you that are gonna lift you up and not tear you down. If people are trying to tear down everything you do, if they're insulting everything you do, saying you're not good enough, you don't need them around. I was told my whole life growing up, you're too old to start a new sport. You're too tall to do this. You're not, I had a high school diving coach that called me a waste of space and kicked me off the team. But I didn't listen to those people. But these kids that are building me up, I listen to them. And it doesn't matter how old you are. I don't care if you're young, you're old. I, I don't care what your station in life is. You can make all the difference in the world to the person next to you if you're just there to have their back, if you're just there to encourage them in the moments when they need it. It doesn't always take a lot, but knowing that somebody's in your corner and you're not going through something alone can change somebody's whole world, their whole outlook on life and what's going on around them. And those kids did that for me in those moments. And at the Olympic trials, so I, I got my cast off and I only had about two and a half weeks to get all my dives back and go to the Olympic trials, which to me is insane. That's like no preparation time at all. But because I had been on that 10 meter every single day, going through all of my actions, spending time up there, it wasn't so scary when you're up there every single day, um, going through video study, like the stuff was so ingrained in my brain that it all came back so fast. And y'all, you know, I was terrified to go to the Olympic trials because I'd never been to one before. And that's like your dreams are on the line there. I mean, like the Olympics are great, but you got to get to the Olympics. Like the Olympic trials are a really big stinking deal. You got to get top two there to go. And so I was really nervous. But after what I had just been through, I was so excited to just be there that that overpowered all the fear and doubts and anxiety that I had. And I ended up winning the Olympic trials by a huge margin making that Olympic team. And you know, we went on to the Olympics for were a few uh, a few months after that, and I have to tell you, like I I had a pretty good shot at making the Olympic team if I hadn't broken my foot. Like I was one of the better divers, I probably would have still been on the team, but I can pretty much guarantee you I would not have stood on top of the podium at the Olympics if I had not broken my foot. And I know that sounds crazy, but when I broke my foot and it forced us to think outside the box and do things that I never do and stretch outside my comfort zone, I grew in a way that I never had planned on. I didn't know you could grow. I became so mentally strong that I was prepared for the next adventure at the Olympic Games. Like, we can't run from these challenges that we face. When you have these big obstacles in front of you, when you figure out a way to get through it, around it, over it, under it, but you get through that obstacle, it is preparing you for something even larger and more important that's coming down the road. And that's what that, that foot break, I thought that was everything. I thought that was just the end. I didn't know. It was just, it was such a momentous event, but that was actually preparing me for such a bigger event 
in the middle, like middle of the Olympic games, the most important moments in my finals, like there was all kinds of, I mean, I don't have too much time to talk. I would love to go into a lot of that, but there are five dives in the finals at the Olympic games. And several of those rounds were a little crazy for us. Um, I was coming from way behind in the prelims and semis. I was seated seated in fifth, but my scores that carried over were, were pretty low. I was like 25, 30 points behind the leaders. And in my first two rounds were good, but so were everybody else's. And I wasn't catching up at all. And there were only three dives left. And in the third round, I get up to do, and this is a dive I had done really well lots of times, um, but I'm coming up to get ready for this dive. And I like, like a lot of athletes, I love to put my headphones on and listen to songs to get me kind of in the right mental state. You've, you've heard of the athlete zone, I'm sure, or the state of flow. I like the zone better. And that's kind of that, that perfect mixture of like nervous excitement, but like you can control it. It's not like out of control, <laughs> you know, excitement. It's, it's controlled nerves and excitement. And I go to put my headphones on and this is, you know, like back in the day, I'm gonna date myself a little bit here, but I had a Discman. You know, this is way before our rechargeable cool phones and, and all these devices. Um, I had a Discman that required a couple of AA batteries. And I'm usually a total over prepare y'all. Didn't pack any extra batteries. In the most important moment of my life, the middle of the Olympic games, I'm trying to get a medal and I can't listen to music. And the biggest eye for me is coming up and I promptly panicked like anyone would, you know, what am I supposed to do here? But in those moments, I started talking to myself because I had been doing a lot of talking to myself with all this visualizing and all these, like when I told you when I was back on that 10 meter, I was going through meet scenarios and different things happening immediately after the panic set in, immediately I went to, I've done this dive a million times. I did it at the Olympic trials for 10s. I did it at nationals for 10s. I know this dive so well. I don't need music to hit this dive. I don't have my headphones on the 10 meter when I do this dive. I know exactly how to do this. And I gave myself this pep talk and probably became more confident than I would have been if I had had music on. And y'all, I hit that dive so well. I think I got like nines, nine and a halves on it. And so I felt good. But what happened next was crazy. Apparently, I had put pressure on the rest of the field because I was seated fifth. So the top four girls went directly after me. And I got in the hot tub and I went to um, go sit back in my area, but I couldn't put my headphones on to listen to music because they had died. So I'm hearing all the scores now. And I started hearing some low scores and I, I kind of thought, oh, did they start the whole round over? Because the four girls after me were getting nines all the time. Like they were like machines, they were amazing. And I was like, well, I need to hear who's next because maybe I, maybe I need to go get ready. It's almost my turn. And nope, the third place girl is up now. So I was like, wow, number four, she just, she didn't do so good. But whatever, I got, I got a dive to think about. And then sure enough, I hear low scores again. And I was like, that's, that's very weird. Whatever, it doesn't matter. I still got to think about my dive. Two more times, low scores. And I'm not talking, you know, we, we have a scale from one to 10. 10 is perfect. If you're getting seven and a half eights or above, you're doing pretty well. These girls were getting like threes and fives, like really low for that level. And I just couldn't believe it. I was like, oh my goodness, these people who I thought were like machines are just, totally wiping out. And what I realized is I, I didn't realize after the third round, I had actually gone into the lead at this point. I didn't know that. But what I knew was, you know what, I just closed the gap. I've got to be within striking distance now. But I had two dives left. And the next one was a real struggle for me. I had been struggling with it since I broke my foot because it was the same action I broke my foot on. You have to throw toward the platform. So I was scared I was going to hit my foot again, maybe re-break it. But you also have to stand on the ball of your foot to do it. And that's where my bone was still protruding from underneath. So it was very painful. Um, and in those moments, I, I was like, okay, well, I don't have any music, but I need to go talk to my coach and he'll help me get through this. And I go to talk to him and he looks at me and he says, do it for Hillary. And he walks away and that's it. Not Nothing how to do the dive. No, go get him, whatever. Just do it for Hillary. And he walks off. So I wander up this ladder of, Okay, he's trying to make me cry because Hillary was a teammate of ours that we had lost in a car accident a few years before. And I am like, why is he trying to make me cry in this most important moment of my life after all that we had been through? What is he doing? But I trusted my coach. He had been there through all of this with me. I knew he had done that for a reason. And so I went there and I started thinking about her. And I started to remember a conversation that we had had one time. See, she was a 
a really good gymnast before she started diving. She actually was the first alternate on the 1992 gymnastics team, Olympic gymnastics team. And she started diving the next year the same time I did. And I remember I had asked her one time at dinner, you know, if you could go to the Olympics and diving to the Olympic trials, like, would you try it? And she's like, ah, you know, I don't know if I could come so close again and not make it. I'm not sure if I'd even want to try. She goes, but if anyone on our team is going to make it, Laura, it's going to be you. And I remembered those words in that moment. And I realized that this was an opportunity she never really got. And all those kids that were cheering me on when I wanted to give up, I'm, I might be their opportunity. And I, I realized in that moment when I was scared and when I was in pain, that this wasn't really about me and my dream anymore. It was so much bigger than that. It was so much more important. And I felt like I had this different purpose. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't for me anymore. It was for everyone else who had been there for me. And I remember standing on the end of that platform and I raised my hands and I felt so tall and I wasn't scared and I couldn't feel the pain anymore. And I gave it everything that I had. And to me, that dive, that's what made the difference. Um, that dive kept me in the lead. You know, and the last dive was good. Uh, it was solid. It was enough to keep me there. Um, but it was, it was a very crazy final to me. And I remember it in such detail because it was just so unusual for all of those things to happen in such a short amount of time. But I love looking back because every time I encountered something weird or something that was trying to stop me in my path or something that I thought was going to end um, the road that I was on, we found a way around it or to go right through it. And every time it made me better, it grew me it, and it expanded me in ways that I never thought possible. And so now, you know, I, I, I'm 43 and I'm trying to make my fourth Olympic team after I retired for nine years and I now have four kids. Uh, so we're kind of on a crazy road again. I actually had a two level cervical fusion. So I have a titanium plate in my neck now that I got about two years ago. So it has just been obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. But I know that every time I walk through those obstacles, it's going to continue to grow me. And maybe I'll end up on the podium again. Maybe I won't but I know that I'm gonna become a better person through all of those challenges. And to me, that's the greatest reward you could get is to be a champion in life, not just in the pool. And um, just to end that, I'll, I'll actually show you my bling. Um, so it's right there if you guys wanna check it out. That's actually the Olympic gold. It's pretty cool. It's got the rings and the Sydney Opera House on the back and a little embroidery there, Sydney 2000. So that's it. So, you know, I've, I've been to three Olympic games. Um, one, only one, two of them I didn't medal, but um, it doesn't mean the ones I didn't win weren't worth it. I wouldn't change anything. I got to travel the world. I got to do incredible things. I pushed my athletic ability and found out just what I was capable of. And, you know, sometimes dreams do come true. So that definitely makes them worth fighting for. So I think, Amy, I know you mentioned maybe there would be some questions if you guys um, have some questions. I don't know how you want to proceed next. <laughs> Yes. Um, well, Laura, thank you so much. And um, what I thought we might do is um, if people could uh, put their questions in the, um, because the attendees can't um, unmute themselves. So um, if you could either put your questions in, let's do the Q&A because um, it seems that that's where people have kind of started. So, um, and then if people have questions, then I'll just let you know what their questions are. I'll try to keep track of both, but let's let's aim for the question and answer. So does anybody have any questions? Go ahead and put it in the question and answer, and I will pose the questions to Laura. Mm -hmm. And I'll start off with one. Um, Laura, can you tell us, um, or can you tell the, the other folks um, a little bit about your, um, your journey as a, um, from when you retired, to when you came back to diving, um, parenthood and, and all those types of things a little bit, because I think that's very interesting part of your life story. Sure. Um, yeah, I retired in 2008. Uh, I was 30, which was considered really old for a diver back then. Um, but it wasn't so much that I was ready to be done diving. I was just ready to be a mom. And we struggled for a while to get pregnant, um, but finally decided to adopt, which my brother was adopted. So for me, I thought that was a great, a great choice. And so we started the adoption process for um, our daughter Zoe in China. And about a year into that process, actually got pregnant and had our oldest, Arela. 
And then, um, so when Rayla was about a year and a half old, we brought Zoe home, who was a year old. So they're only six months apart, which has been really crazy and fun all at the same time. And about six months after we brought Zoe home, we decided, man, that adoption process, that was so cool. We want to have more kids. Let's adopt again. And we decided to go with Ethiopia this time. And literally three days after we signed our adoption paperwork from Ethiopia, I found out I was pregnant with my son, Zadik. So we kind of went from one to four, or at least the idea of four really fast. So all of my kids are within um, four years of each other, uh, but it's it's crazy and it's fun. And um, yeah, I guess it was about 2016. Um, I had been, I went to 2012 Olympics with NBC as part of media there, which was really a different experience. Um, and I went back to in Rio uh, with NBC also. I was on the pool doing some like deck analysis uh, of the diving. And at that point I had kind of considered possibly coming back because my event really, it had peaked in difficulty back in 2008 um, in, in that kind of era. And then there was a big drop in difficulty um, not to discredit anyone still training at that time, you know, but it would just wasn't the same level of competition I had seen. And I always in the back of my head was like, I wonder if I could get in the mix again. And after Rio in 2016, my husband said, you know what, we've got the fall. Like, why don't you just try, like, just go all in for the fall and let's just see if you can do it. Or if you decide, you know what, I, I really can't do it or I don't want to anymore. And so we gave myself the fall and by January I had my entire list back off 10 meter and decided to compete again. And so it kind of snowballed from there, but we, we had a lot of ups and downs. Um, after starting competition again, I, I had a, a neck surgery that, that two level cervical fusion and bringing our daughter home from Ethiopia. There's a lot of struggles with that. So it's been, and then the pandemic and the postponement of the Olympics. So it's been really kind of a tumultuous last four years. Uh, but you know, I would expect no different. <laughs> Um, Kristen, I cannot get the question and answer to open. There's some questions in there, but I can't seem to get it to open. Um, so we're going to have to do one of two things. Either people are going to have to retype their questions in the chat, um, or Kristen, you're going to have to let me know if, um, you can see it or Laura, if you can see them. I can't. Uh, yeah. With my glasses on. Sorry. My old lady glasses here. It is so kind of hard to see in the, the, um, Q and A, but I will do my best. Um, Laura, someone said they really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Um, they wanted to know, did you keep your promise to your mom? Yes, I did. Of course I did. I immediately went back and I had two, I did two very full semesters, but I graduated uh, in December of 2001 with my bachelor's in um, PR. Awesome. Next question that we have, um, let's see, when you're going through something hard, how do you keep your focus on the long game? And that, that can be hard because sometimes when you have long-term goals, it's hard in the here and now because it seems so far away. So I love to kind of make stair-step goals. Like I'll have this big end goal that I'm shooting for, but I try to make smaller goals um, along the way to kind of keep me on track. Everything that would would lead me to that bigger goal, but um, but you know, that can give me something to shoot for now that is also going to be in line. So, you know, I have Olympic trials in June. So right now, you know, maybe I have a competition at the end of March that I want to do, not just compete at, but maybe I want to do a certain dive to a certain level, or, you know, I want to get a certain score. I want to change a technique. So I would make those kind of little stepping stone goals that all will lead to that big end goal, but kind of keep you more in the here and now and, and still excited where, yeah, those long-term goals can sometimes just drain you because it just feels so far away. And you're like, what am I doing right now? So definitely smaller goals in the interim. We're going to have to go with Amy's um, suggestion. Unfortunately, the Q&A is just really hard to see for whatever reason. So if everyone who posted something in Q&A could um, put it in the chat, that would be great. Um, if you do it to all panelists, that's great because all three of us will see it. Um, and that will ensure that we don't miss your question. So, Laura, um, I know that one of the other things that you do is you have you are not a, a, a one um, you don't focus everything on one thing. You are involved in so many other things. Does that help you with the diving? Um, does it take away from it? Like, you know, being a parent, being involved in the community, um, doing um, the, when you do the announcing, when you do um, 
uh, community, you know, things within the community, all of that, does that help you with your diving or does it distract from it? That's a great question. And, uh, you know, I learned that balance is a bit of a unicorn. <laughs> um, I don't know that there is actual life balance that you can get because if you want to do something really well, like you need to be all in, you need to be fully there. And I think it's just kind of morphed a little bit. And I do struggle with like, Sometimes I have to be away from the kids because I have to do extra practices or like this weekend, I have to drive to San Antonio because we don't have access to a platform nearby right now. So I have to do seven hour round trips to San Antonio on the weekends, um, which takes away from time with my kids. And that's hard right now, but they understand that it's for a limited amount of time. And we talk on the phone during my drive sometimes, or, you know, I'll have special dates with them. So, you know, we try to make up for it where we can, but you know, when it's kind of cool because now when I dive, I feel like that's my time where before it was like, it was my job or this is what I'm doing. Or I, you know, it was kind of like the only thing I had, it felt like. So it is nice that like, I have all this time with the kids, but sometimes it's like, okay, now this is my time to do my thing. And I can just be fully present for it because I can leave. I don't know. I've just, I've just learned to kind of leave this here and now I can go to the pool and that's my time at the pool. And it's, I, I've just kind of learned to let things go. But the only problem is if somebody tells me something at the pool, I may forget by the time I get home <laughs> because I've learned to also let the pool go when I go home. So it's really kind of trying to like, you know, not be a different person everywhere I go, but just letting go of some of the stress um, that's happening in this area while I'm focusing on this. Because when I'm with my kids, I want to be fully with my kids. I don't want to be you know, doing all this stuff. Or sometimes like if I'm working out, a lot of times I do like my plyometrics at home. My kids like to join me or they cheer me on. I have one kid, I'll run sprints out the side and she'll come run sprints with me. And you know, she's five, she doesn't keep up. But I said, okay, mommy's gonna go first. And then you come right behind me, you know, and she'll she'll do twice as many as I will, you know? And so it's, it's been cool actually with COVID is that I've kind of learned to let my kids be more a part of this. Or before it was like, I need to do this and have control. And now I've kind of learned like they can be part of the process and it's actually way more fun. And I feel like I'm with them more and they understand that it's not like mommy goes here and does this thing. They see what I'm doing and they see like the hard work that it takes day in and day out. And they, they saw me wipe out on a chair trying to jump up on one leg and the chair fell and I just smashed it. They see mommy screw up sometimes, you know, and I think that's good and it, it gives us good conversations. So another question um, from the chat is um, what were some challenges um, that you faced coming out of retirement that you didn't expect? Um, kind of like my, an identity issue, I would say. Um, a lot of athletes were so wrapped up in our sport that we don't always know who we are without our sport. And, you know, sometimes it, it gets so bad to where like you feel like your self-worth is kind of whatever your score at the end of the meet or whatever place you are, that's how you see your value. And, you know, being forced away from that and having to, to realize that you're valuable just because you're you and that matters. Um, that's kind of hard sometimes to be confronted with, but it was, it was really good for me to have to go through that process and to discover that me as a human is, is just as valuable as me as an athlete, you know? And so I think having the time away from the pool and adjusting and learning how to be a mom and like, being home with three kids under three all the time. And that's all I did, you know, and I wanted to pull my hair out, but like realizing that's just part of life and that's part of the process. And, um, you know, it just, all those things I feel like have grown me and given me more experience and wisdom, which make me better at all kinds of other things, you know? Um, so the next question is, um, how has being in the Olympics um, changed your life? What impacts has it had? Um, I mean, it's definitely given me different experiences. I've had the chance to travel to really cool places and meet incredible people. And, um, you know, the Olympics themselves are just kind of crazy. Like, it's really cool to just see other athletes and other sports and, and how that works. But um, I don't think it's really changed me much as a person. Um, I think just the experiences I've, I've gotten to have are, are really unique and, and different and fun on that level. But um, yeah, I, I don't think it's changed me personally at all. Because, you know, there's if you have problems, if you have issues, you have character flaws, and you get a gold medal, it doesn't change anything. It just magnifies it. So if you win or lose, you know, your character is just going to come out more, you know, and if you lose even more of your character is going to show. Like I've seen people who've lost and literally laid on the floor kicking and screaming like a toddler. And that got on international TV. So you learn how to win with grace and lose with grace. And, and you have to be that person, not just on the outside. You have to be that person because you have to be able to go on with your life, whether you win or lose. And I've done both and they've both been hard to deal with. So you, you have to become the person that is enough with or without the medal. 
And and I don't know um, of any instances of this, but I'm just I'm certain that you have. How did you um, when you came out of retirement? Um, how did you process or or deal with um, people who were like, "What are you doing? <laughs> you you know, you had your time. Go go do your go. You know, we don't want you, or we or you can't do this. What are you thinking? How did you how did you let that go and just you know, it's been really interesting. Honestly, I expected a lot of that and I tried to prepare myself to handle that. And I've had very, very little. Like, I, I can't believe how many people are actually very supportive of what I'm doing. Like, it's it's almost been shocking to me how supportive people have been because I did not expect that. I mean, maybe people are saying things behind my back that I haven't heard and that's fine. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I've, I've been very surprised by the support. My mom was probably the biggest person going, you're doing what? Like, what? She, and she goes, don't expect me to travel this time. <laughs> She's like, I've paid my dues. But um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's well, been- I got to see how how wonderful the team, how supportive the team was. And again, you got a whole new crew of little kids, <laughs> littles who just think that you're, you know, oh my gosh, Laura's diving with us, you know? So that's been very, uh, very amazing for them to, to see that and, and have that in their lives, I know. So, um, so the next question from the chat is, how do you prepare for a dive now? Do you still listen to music um, or have you found something that works better now? Um, so what do you uh, do now? Yeah, that's a great question. I do still like to listen to music, especially if it's a longer uh, meet where you have longer time in between turns. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I don't need it as much as I used to. Um, I talk to myself a lot. Like I've just always been a very, I've, actually it's funny. I've always been a very introverted person. I used to actually hate speaking to groups and things, but I've, I've come to enjoy it now. Um, but I'm, I, I dwell on things. I think about things a lot and I just kind of stay in my own head or give myself pep talks. So it hasn't changed too much. Um, but you know, I kind of have to like remember that again, because I've only competed a handful of times in the last four years. I competed in 2017, then I couldn't in 2018 or 2019. Competed twice last year before the COVID shutdown and the postponement. And then, yeah, so I'm just, I'm trying to like remember all of those things. But my coach gave me some great advice the other day. He said, you don't have to get to a bunch of competitions to remember how to compete. You need to be confident with your dives and the competing will come back naturally. So I'm hanging on to that. <laughs> All right, so I don't see any other questions. If you have, if anybody has any other questions, um, make sh uh, go ahead and put those in the chat. Thank um, you, Kathy Moore. Um, this says, um, okay, this is from I think one of our professors. A ten-year-old asks if you've done any other sports, and then a seven-year-old asks how many places you've been competing. Ooh, good questions. So I did do another sport. Um, I actually grew up as a gymnast. So, and I love gymnastics. I was, I think, a level nine when I um, retired. But then I tried, I didn't know about diving initially. So I tried tennis and softball and track. And I even did the, the drill team, the dance team my freshman year of high school before I found diving. So I've tried a lot of things, but it, the acrobatics just really sucked me in. I, I love being on the pool deck, gymnastics into the water, like that music blaring usually on the pool deck. So that's, that's my happy place for sure. Um, how many places have I competed? Um, been to Australia like seven or eight times, been to China six or seven times. We've dove training camps in Korea, um, competed in Spain, Germany, Greece, uh, been to Italy, but I didn't compete there. Let's see, right, Russia. Um, yeah, so lots of Mex what, Mexico. Been to Brazil, but I didn't compete there. I was covering the Olympics, but yeah. Well, been to a lot of places, competed a lot of places. We tend to go back to the same ones over and over again. <laughs> So what pool do you like on that on that same strand? What's your favorite place to dive? Mm. And you, besides the one that you can't dive at anymore. Yeah, I know. Well, yeah, the WAC, where, where we grew up, the Women's Athletic Center, that was my home. That's where I grew up, um, but it was torn down in 2009, so that was really sad. But that will always and forever be my favorite. Um, I loved Mission Viejo. I haven't, they rebuilt their pool. It's in California. Um, that's a great outdoor pool that actually reminded me of the WAC a lot. Um, they rebuilt it. It's supposed to be spectacular. I hope to dive there before I retire. Um, Montreal was fun. I won the world championships and, and they had outdoor pool in Montreal. Not sure why, but it's beautiful in the summer. Um, I'm sure that's pretty cold in the winter, but that, that was a great pool. Um, Sydney obviously will always have a special, special place in my heart. Um, yeah, there's been, there's been a lot of good ones. There's been a lot of really bad ones too, but, but there's been a lot of good ones. So, so as, um, 
you again this wasn't you didn't mention this in your speech but i just know this from from knowing you um you've done synchro diving um as well as individual diving how how different what's the what's different about the 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 whole mindset and the teamwork and the mentality of diving synchro diving um versus individual diving i i don't you might want to explain what synchro diving is before yeah, that's a great question, Amy. Um, so synchro diving is where you have two divers either on the platform or on two springboards side by side, and they're doing the same dives at the same time. So you want it to look like one person's going, you want to be matched up, which I think it's a great spectator event because you don't have to know anything about diving technically to know if people were very together or very not. So it's great for the crowd. Um, and I actually got to do it right at the beginning when Synchro became an event at the world level. Um, so Kenny Armstrong, my coach, his wife, Patty, at the time was diving was our national champion and i had just started diving 10 meter and we had very similar actions so they paired us up and we started winning national championships and i went to world cup and we got a bronze medal at the very first international world meet that it was in we got a bronze medal i got to do it at the first olympic games in sydney uh, when it was introduced there um, and so it's a fun event because it's our only really team option and um it's great especially when you have a partner you really get along with and you trust um but it's as much teamwork as it is, you know, so there's a little compromise in maybe how you do things like, you know, somebody that your partner may have to change a little bit, you may have to change a little bit. Um, but really, once you kind of count like one, two, three, go, you really have to just pay attention to yourself and trust that you and your partner have worked on the timing that that's going to happen. So um, often people dive better in synchro than individual because i think when you think about your partner you're not worried as much about your dive and so you're naturally letting your, your body take over which is what we should do individually <laughs> but a lot of times that that's kind of a gift in synchro where people end up diving better because they're not as stressed out about themselves they're worried a little bit more about their partner so it's a fun event to watch Amy, we can't hear you. Okay, sorry, I, I, I muted myself. Um, so the another question from the chat is, um, how do you deal with imposter syndrome? I'm not sure what that means. Do you know what that means? I'm hoping. I, I mean, like, d feeling like you're not measuring up kind of thing? Like, I'm not sure. Is that, I'm not sure. I mean, I think we all go through doubts. You know, we all feel like, well, should I really be doing this or am I, am I good enough? I think if maybe that's what you're talking about, like, I, I think we all have that. I mean, I've been to three Olympics. I've won every world meet that you can win. And I still sometimes I'm like, what am I doing? Can I really do this? Like even, even at the peak of my career, I felt that I think we all have those moments of doubt and fear, you know, but you got to remember like fear's a liar. Like fear comes into your head and tells you things that aren't true. It's like fear is an opinion. It's not a fact, it, you know, but we have these things that flood our heads like doubt and fear and we believe it and we don't need to. It's usually just our anxiety and our, our fears creeping up on us. But if you think those things, you got to kind of stop it in its tracks before because it'll build up and get bigger and bigger in your head. But if you can stop it and be like, that is not true. That's simply an opinion. And I have the opportunity to prove it wrong. You know, that's that's more of the kind of a route I would take, I guess. So if you're feeling like an imposter, I think that's just your doubt and fear trying to play tricks on you and call it out, snip it in the bud. And I, I see that with students sometimes, you know, we have um, we have uh, faculty and, and students both, you know, as a student, you, um, you'll have people, oh, I don't know if I should be here. Of course you should be here, you know? <laughs> There's no, there's no reason you shouldn't be here any more than anybody else should be here. Um, and all you have to do is, is come and, and do the work and put in the effort and um, kind of like, you know, you said, you just have to focus on what you need to do and not, not what um, anybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. So I think that's our last question. Kristen, do you see any other questions? I don't, I do believe that was the last one. Okay. Well, with that, Laura, I, we will let you go back and um, and be with your family and call it an evening. Thank you so much for being here with us. We really, really appreciate it. And um, we hope that we will definitely be cheering you at trials and hopefully be cheering you at, um, at the Olympics in August, right? Yeah, I think it's end of July. It starts end of July. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. And well, um, they just announced that they are going to hold 
hold the Olympics, but they're not going to let out of country spectators. Um, I saw that anyway. I'm not sure if that's 100%. I saw that Japan said they were going to have the Olympics, but they weren't going to allow any spectators from out of the country. So your mom doesn't have to travel. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually been decided yet because Tokyo is still about to open up. And there's a World Cup at the end of April uh, for diving where one of my teammates is going to that. So we'll, we'll know more kind of by that time. But it is real weird with all the uncertainties and unknowns of what it's going to look like. Um, so it's, it's just a whole other obstacle to get through, you know. <laughs> well, and Thank you all so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you. We hope to be cheering you on in, in July and August. And um, thank you so much. Take Thanks. care. Bye. Be sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.